the cover of this book um, is, is actually a photograph. It was um, supplied by the <clears throat> Brookhaven National Laboratory. I, I'd seen it first on a cover of Scientific American some years ago. Uh, it represents uh, a collision of gold nuclei accelerated almost to the speed of light. It's an attempt to reproduce conditions early on uh, in the origin of the cosmos. Um, last night, my wife and I saw on Neil deGrasse as a visitor on, uh, I remember, don't remember the talk show host, but Neil deGrasse Tyson is our current host of the new Cosmos series, and he was uh, eulogizing our new uh, origin story in terms of things like, for example, the periodic table. If you studied chemistry, you know that from lighter to heavier or heavier to lighter, I've forgotten which way it goes, all these elements which uh, have larger and larger nuclei and more and more electrons spinning around. Now we know, we being this culture, uh, where it came from. Uh, these elements were synthesized from original hydrogen just after the so-called Big Bang. Um, you might have read recently of this uh, radio telescope thing at the South Pole seeing slight asymmetries in the residual um, energy cloud from the Big Bang. And these slight curly cues indicate that there were some asymmetries from the very beginning so that these first atoms could condense into stars. Because if there were no asymmetries, if they were perfectly dispersed, there would be no reason that they would be attracted more in one direction to another. So my view is that the current scientists and cosmologists have given us a wondrous and very convincing story of after, after the so-called Big Bang. They have not the least idea in the world of before. They do not know how it happened or why it happened. I have my own reasons for thinking that it might have been more than simply meaningless. But we, we won't go down that road. But let me say that um, as a sort of lapsed Methodist who spent many happy hours, and some not so happy in our church there in Stanisburg, hearing the scriptures being read and various people being assigned to salvation or damnation, I, I, I still have a, a sort of a lingering you know, religious thing, but it, the particulars, I was never happy about hell, really. I mean, uh, uh, it, there, were, there was no convenient place for it to be, among other things. I was interested in um, astronomy from early on, and uh, I couldn't see, you know. There's really no up or down out there. It's all, uh, it's made by gravity. Gravity, which Newton thought a kind of universal love, which I'm kind of am for. And by the way, um, the standard model of physics, which explains more or less the, uh, the force holding the nucleus together, uh, the force holding the electrons, the electromagnetic force around the nucleus, um, uh, doesn't have a, and the, and the weak force, which allows radioactive decay, uh, uh, without which we couldn't evolve, uh, they don't know what to do with gravity, you know. Um, this rug kind of reminds me of Einstein's version <laughs> of gravity, which is, you know, that there's some um, flexions in, you know, space-time, and makes me a little, but <laughs> I mean, the, the Einsteinian diagram is that uh, weight, <coughs> weight makes, bends, bends space time, so we sort of fall in toward the weight. I didn't, but you hear the uh, scientists talk, and they, they really think of gravity as a force, you know, it really, and, and it's the big one that holds us all together, and, and they, don't know, they don't know what it is. So here we are in a, in a big cosmos that has a wonderful story of beginning. Uh, and we have other histories. We have local histories. We have, my wife and I, these generational histories of grandparents and parents and a life in a town of a thousand people and then going away to Duke University and studying things like physics and symbolic logic and all this stuff and becoming a professor and living kind of in another world and surviving deconstruction and, um, you know, the wars, the English department wars, which I've lived through, kind of a non-combatant but got injured anyway. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so we, here we are in a very strange world. And I, um, if, if you think about human life on Earth, it, it isn't a reasonable affair. 
you're born, you grow up. Nobody tells you about what you need to know. They tell you a lot of stuff you don't need to know. You sort of stagger along learning by experience and, and you, you have something called a career and you're happy or you aren't and then you die and what comes after is anybody's guess. It's not a reasonable proposition. So, you know. And I don't like the Tea Party's people politics, but the fact that they are unhappy with the liberal humanist explanation, I think is, is kind of plausible. I mean, uh, anyway, enough of that. Well, in, in Cosmos, I'm trying to situate my life story and me and my wife and our extended family and our grandchildren and so on, in, in this place, this place where there isn't any up and down, except for, well, gravity, and there's this nice place we have called Earth, and it, it holds us to its surface. It binds us here with more than physical gravity. It binds us to a kind of emotional gravity through the taste of the food we eat, uh, the water we drink, uh, the loves we know, the grass we run on when we're a kid across the lawn, the lightning bugs flashing. And, and so I'm trying to situate my little small town experience in cosmic space and time. Now that's not too much to try. I mean, that, that's pretty, pretty, well, okay, so it, maybe. But if you can read it through from beginning to end, you'll see that that's where it's going. Um, Maybe I should just give you a, a sample poem from the science part um, that's kind of related to here. This is called Anthropic Cosmological Principle. And, um, you know, in CERN at uh, the consortium, they located what they think of the Higgs boson, and um, the Italian physicist had some things to say about it. Here's a short quote from uh, Guido Tonelli, as reported. Uh, New York Times, March 5, 2013. If true, it is somehow magic. We are here because we have been lucky, because for this particular universe, the lottery produced a certain set of numbers which will allow the universe to have an evolution which is very long, meaning long enough to evolve the elements of which we are made. We are very lucky. We should feel thanks for that look. Uh, we should appreciate the beauty of the, use of the cosmos. When I'm seeing those wonderful star fields that, uh, from the Hubble telescope that you can see on TV, the only thing I miss from the commentary is, why didn't you say how stunningly, awesomely beautiful that is? What a sublimity that we are heir to. We inherit this universe of these flaming dimensionalities and here we are to live in love for our time. That's what this <clears throat> poem is about. We're on the parkway, my wife and I. I use it a metaphor, the bead, the skein of time. I think of these as kind of like, um, well, the things that the telomeres, uh, the, um, our genes are strung on. We, we, are, we are bead work, we human beings with our genetic coding. But I also think of our time as like a line with little blips of memory upon it. The moment last night, walking the streets of Asheville, or lots of things that one might do in one's time. And here it is. So we bead the skein of time in a cosmos orderly and random, free among determinants, breeding descendants, riding the one-way arrow uncanny to us consciously. We know only the autumn parkway suspended by granite mountain below beech and maple yellows among iron rust oaks like the armor of dead Vikings. The panorama receding in stilled waves of earth crust folding, leaving the motion only evening felt coming in the turning of the monolith mountain. Spruces spike up, bronze evergreen, among earthward deciduous longings as a radiance strikes us from a hawked winged point in the distance. Bedazzled by this chance of consciousness, our breathing inconstantly praises these decrees of the stars. Our years have followed the curve of horizon at evenings, the marking of arcs within it. 
of our infants' buttocks and cheeks, our tears and fingernail moons, accepting this good luck of time within an autumn wind leaving the taste of color in mind, a chill still young upon our faces and the flavor of the body of a co-life lover on the tongue. I celebrate also um, my release, um, I'm coming home, I've done my time. I told my wife when I got home after retiring from Duke University, English Department, 2009. So here I am in the gardens beside a library. This is not really uh, a cosmic poem, but still, I'm inflecting the surface of earth a little bit. I'm walking there in the, in the, in the gardens and I pass these trees with their little labels on them, and then I think I don't have to read those labels anymore, those knowledge trees. Think of Genesis. <laughs> but up the hill there, uh, there's the library, that fortress-like place where I labored with those huge volumes of 18th century loco descriptive poems and so on, and where my uh, thesis advisor, Lionel Stevenson, had his Excuse me, I'm <laughs> still choking up a whole lot. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a long time ago. <laughs> I'm getting really soft in the head. Okay, well. <laughs> One of these willow oaks, you see a willow oak sometimes, they turn very bronze, but the wind kind of wears off the surface, and it's like looking at a, at a rug or, or a little rug, so you see the web and woof underneath. In the gardens beside a library, the willow oak has written in it an ink of time underlayment. I say the word emeritus, and the wind-rubbed coppery surface touches my eyes like a worn rug. Corded by limbs to a base in soil, it recovers those years of toil that layered other leaves in another place. The library's vellum and coffee still drug my memory like gothic walls and trees above. There I and my gnarled masters strove, limning interpretive cursives and dots onto the passionate dead's still living arguments. There wide-browed Lionel carried his satchel into the crenellated tower, kindly impersonal, and shone his lamp through a diamonded window out toward me where I read my fortune through the screening tree and felt ideals on its shadowy history. This fortress-like place of these pasts standing behind me casts no shadow on my course, where free in the twilight I pass the labeled species, these knowledge trees, not reading and with no remorse. As I walk farther on, one orange-green golden final maple says that vision is wisdom, that beauty is changing and is its own meaning. The space of time is at last my own. Well, well, time goes fast when you're having fun. I'm having fun. I don't know if you guys are. I'm going to read a, a, a quickie and then a, a last poem, and that'll be it for me. Uh, my poem, my books so are at eleven dollars back there. I think they're only three or four or five or six. But if you want one, that's from placement costs for me. Um, one of the things Jan and I gave ourselves <clears throat> as a present for retiring was we got to go Hawaii. I got myself a, 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 a job as a, giving a paper out there and do help me pay my way. And so here we are, 17 feet, 17 floors above Waikiki there on Oahu. Um, as at night comes on, you see the lights light up all around, and I'm thinking astronomy. I'm thinking a little bit, um, what's that Steven Spielberg movie where they do the lights to shine back to the um, close encounters? With the, yeah, you know, there are the lights up there, and they do the lights down here, and they think they're trying to do a kind of a, do that. I can't do the music, but uh, anyway. <laughs> I'm thinking it's kind of like that. We're trying to shine back to the galaxies. We're trying to have a conversation. Now, but they're so violent. But then I think, yeah, but today we just visited Pearl Harbor, and there's that oil still coming up from the Arizona. So, you know. Um, the other thing I'm thinking is, gee, it's kind of cool, too, because um, this is where they made the movie From Here to Eternity, and today we, uh, we visited that place where Burt Reynolds and um, 
whatever her name was, sort of wallowed around in the foam, you know, at Deborah Carr. Thanks, there. <laughs> she, you know, I, this is cool. I, I like this. Um, and this is a little short poem, got all that in it. And you get all this for $10. And uh, there's also a, a reference to uh, Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, but I won't go into that. <laughs> a hotel tower above Oahu while blue-black transparent night floods into Waikiki, street lights along the Manalani Heights come on. Here on the balcony, I see the dingy neighborhoods turned toward Pearl Harbor we drove this afternoon. They shine afar with strung bulbs and fainter rosaries of light bead farthest mountains. Below by the harbor, we walk below sunset. Within those dimly sparkled arms of land, a few breakers whiten. Yesterday we saw the bay where Bert and Deborah lay. You vowed your love from here to eternity. Only from the long line of spray I hear a roar of beginning of armies clashing. By our own made lights we watch creation spill its accidental beauty. These necklace linking bulbs shine back like galaxies from the dark of earth beside the ancient crater of Diamond Head. The other way, an old war is at anchor, Arizona submerged, leaking oil up toward the stars. I, I read this poem in an earlier form at that celebration of me uh, in, uh, gee, I don't like that, but, you know, um, in Hillsborough. I'm going to read it again because it's kind of a, it's a poem that I was working to in the whole book. The language of space and time, I use the word counterpane. That's an old-fashioned word for bedspread, you know. When I was a boy <clears throat> with rheumatic fever at seven years old, I lay there and the counterpane was my little countryside of hills and valleys where I imagined different countries. And, uh, but now uh, it's different. It's really only the village where I am, but I have the feeling that this kind of village, which I will leave, will be reproduced by the forces of space and time and the human heart and its need for adhesiveness to each other and to a place and to gravity will, will happen again. So that's this what poem is. The counterpane now is only space, an extent in light. Once it encoded a town in belief, when grass spread wide its uttering tongues below children. A skyline on the western horizon seemed cut out of paper. Huge heads of oaks, those elders, nodded over the low roof angles and the wooden bodies below, alive with shouts and groans, the hopes and mournings. The attics seen from inside held rafters devoutly skyward, like hands in prayer. Atmospheres spoke over these humid lawns, echoing cries between houses at evening, lightning bugs winking, enlarging separation, gathering in darkness, while cooking that the children smell from outside the yellowing windows bound their taste to this earth with more gravity. Submerge them in feeling, their words soft-edged, blurring the consonants, inflecting bedtime whispers with a particular belonging. So that earth may speak of space, it has brewed these rounded off gut urge surges of breath with tastes of long cooked meat, night in the nostrils, part two. Over the town now shattered on the counterpane, lightning flashes. As the storm gathers in upon the hurried inhabitants, rain in stringent lines splashes their faces like the slight weight of rays from far stars. They look up and back, tears of recognition streaming from their eyes. They have come so far, materialized on this stage that is the same for everything, everyone and different. This possible surface lifts from the earth and recedes into time. I behold it departing with a rending like the soul tearing loose from my body. And in that moment I am consoled by knowing what love is possible, how so much expands with the newborn light and morning, and how this whiteness deepens, rich with a thousand kisses, shattered by this land with its snake stealthy river, the air passing under a bridge, enlarged within the arms and breasts of a lover along the lone road at nightfall, 
in moth-lifting evening. This remembered fabric, like a counterpane folded and refolded between a mother and daughter, is a membrane of space and time, surface of love, experience of place on earth, a town, somewhere to exist again. Thank you. Congratulations again to the winners of the James Applewhite Poetry Prize. And Jim, what a wonderful reading. What a, what a, um, a just magnificent um, joining of heart and intellect. I could feel that as I was listening to your poems. Thank you so much. Let's give Jim and the winners another round of applause. <laughs>